So we are looking first, although a lot of it has been removed, is a superficial fascia of the trunk, which is kind of the umbrella term, which when you go dorsal on the pelvis, it becomes a superficial gluteal fascia over here. Um, and then it more, as a more over there, more over there, <laughs> and as it passes to the tail, it would become the superficial caudal fascia, and as it continues distally on the limb, it becomes a superficial lamina of the fascia lata. Um, so that would be over here. Um, the thoracolumbar fascia, which is the deep fascia of the trunk, so it's this thicker fascia here. It's different than the other, which kind of looks fatty and sticks. This is like thick and membranous. It's a deep fascia of the trunk and is well developed in the lumbar region is continued caudally as the iliac crest, which is around here. Um, by the do by the deep gluteal fascia. And so and the deep caudal fascia, the uh, distally the deep gluteal fascia blends with the fascia of the thigh, which is over he over here, where it becomes the medial which would be underneath, and the lateral femoral fascia. The medial fascia is thin. I'm trying to find you some. It's a little bit thinner. Mm, there's not much of it. Well, a little bit. It's, as you can see, it's a little bit thinner. While on the top, you have the lateral femoral fascia, and it's much thicker and serves as an upper neur neurotic insertion for thigh muscles. Here we have the biceps femoris, which originates from the tuber ischii and the sacrotuberous <coughs> ligaments, uh, and it inserts at the fascia lata as well as the crural fascia. So here it is right here. We've transected it and it extends the hip, stifle and hock, and the caudal part of the muscle flexes the stifle. It is innervated by the sciatic nerve. The popliteal lymph node lying the fat at its caudal border, directly caudal to the stifle, is right here, painted with this white pin. The common calcanean tendon, right here, is formed by a strand of heavy fascia that runs to the tuber calcanei. The semitendinosus, which is right here with this white pen, pin, originates at the sciatic tuberosity up here and inserts at the distocranial border of the tibia, the medial surface of the body of the tibia and the tuber calcanei by means of the crucial fascia. The purpose is to extend the hip, flex the stifle, and extend the hock, and it's innervated by the sciatic nerve. The semimembranosus is wedged between the semitendinosus and the biceps femoris, so it's this yellow one right here. It has two bellies of nearly equal size. It originates at the ischiac tuberosity. Um, can't really see it that well here, but uh, it also inserts at the distal and medial lip of the caudal rough surface of the femur and the medial condyle of the tibia. The purpose is to extend the hip. The part that attaches to the femur extends the stifle. The part that attaches to the tibia flexes or extends the stifle, depending on the position of the limb. It is innervated also by a sciatic nerve. This right here, divided in two parts, is the sartorius. This top part is called the is cranial part, and the bottom part right here is the caudal part. The cranial part originates from the crest of the ilium up there, and the thoracolumbar fascia, while the caudal part originates from the cranial ventral iliac spine and the adjacent ventral border of the ilium. Now, while the cranial part inserts onto the patella in common with the rectus femoris, the caudal part right here will insert into the cranial border of the tibia in common with the gracilis. What the function of the sartorius overall is to flex the hip while the cranial part extends the stifle, the caudal part uh, flexes the stifle. Both of these are innervated by the femoral nerve. This right here is a gracilis, or gracilis, depending on how you pronounce it. Originates from the pelvic symphysis, symphysis by means of the symphysial symph tendon, while it inserts, although the insertion's kind of been torn apart a little, um, inserts into the cranial border of the tibia and with the semitendinosus, the tuber calcinate. It, the function of the gracilis 
is to adduct the limb, flex the stifle, and extend the hip and hock. It is innervated by the obturator nerve. This blue probe is pointing to the femoral triangle, which is the shallow triangular space through which the femoral vessels run to and from the pelvic limb. It is located on the proximal medial surface of the thigh with a space at the abdominal wall. The pectineous muscle here, pointed by this blue probe, originates from the iliopubic eminence, eminence and the pubic tubercle via the prepubic tendon. And it inserts here um, into the distal end of the medial lip of the caudal rough face of the femur. Its purpose is to adduct the limb and it's innervated by the obturator nerve. We are now looking at the adductor, which is consists of two muscles, the adductor magnus, a brevis, and adductor longus, although they're not clearly divisible into, into their two parts. It, they originate at the entire pelvic symphysis by means of the symphysial tendon, the adjacent part of the ischiatic arc, and the ventral surface of the pubis and ischium. And then it inserts down here, which is not very clear, but um, the entire lateral lip of the caudal rough base of the femur. Its action is to adduct the limb and extend the hip, and it's innervated by the obturator nerve. The tensor fascia lati, shown right here, is a triangle muscle that attaches proximally to the tuber coxi. By attach, I mean that's the insertion, or sorry, the origin, and the insertion is the lateral femoral fascia. The action is to tense the lateral femoral fascia, to flex the hip, and extend the stifle. It is innervated by the cranial gluteal nerve. Okay, transected here is the superficial gluteal, and it lies caudal to the middle gluteal. It originates at the lateral borough of the sacrum and the first caudal vertebrae, partly by means of the sacrotuberous ligament, the cranial dorsal iliac spine by means of the deep gluteal fascia. It inserts at the third trochanter, and its action is to extend the hip and abduct the limb and it is innervated by the caudal gluteal nerve. The middle gluteal is this round ovally muscle right here, which originates at the crest and gluteal surface of the ilium and inserts at the greater trochanter. And its action is to extend and abduct the hip and to rotate the pelvic limb immediately. And it's innervated by the cranial gluteal nerve. The deep gluteal is underneath the me middle gluteal, sorry, right here, uh, and it's fan-shaped, completely covered by the middle gluteal. The body of the ilium is its origin, as well as the ischiac spine, right there, and the insertion is the cranial aspect of the greater trochanter. Its action is to extend and abduct the hip and to rotate the pelvic limb medially. It's innervated by the cranial gluteal nerve. So the articulus, articu, articularis cocci would be located beneath the deep gluteal. Um, however, it's difficult to visualize, but it's a spindle-shaped muscle lying on the cranial lateral aspect of the hip joint capsule. It's covered by the deep gluteal muscle, and it rises from the lateral surface of the ilium along with the rectus femoris and inserts on the neck of the femur. Now, the internal obturator is a fan-shaped muscle on the dorsal surface of the ischium and pubis, and we can see its origin right here by visualizing its tendon. This right here, it originates at the symphysis pelvis and the dorsal surface of the ischium and pubis, and inserts at the trochanteric fossa of the femur. Its action is to rotate the pelvis limb laterally at the hip. It's invert, innervated by the sciatic nerve. The gemelli is sort of these two muscles that fuse together, but also surround the tendon of the internal obturator. Uh, its origin is at the lateral surface of the ischium, caudal to the acetabulum, and the ventral to the lesser ischiatic notch. Its insertion is the trochanteric fossa. Its action is to rotate the pelvic limb laterally at the hip, and it's innervated by the sciatic nerve. This is the quadratus femoris looking from the medial view. If we were looking from the lateral view, it'd lie deep in the biceps femoris, where it is superimposed between the adductor medially and the biceps femoris laterally. 
The origin is the ventral surface of the caudal part of the ischium. And the insertion is an enterotrotanteric crest. Its action is to extend the hip and rotate the pelvic limb laterally. And its nerve is the sciatic nerve. Go. Okay, the external obturator is the red pin. As I mentioned before, the green pin was the quadratus femoris. So we're looking at the red pin right now. And it's a fan-shaped muscle that arises from the ventral surface of the pubis ischium. Uh, its insertion is the trochanter, trochanteric fossa. Its action is to rotate the pelvic limb laterally and is integrated by the obturator, obturator nerve. Here we're looking at the quadriceps femoris, which is actually composed of several muscles. Uh, the first one we're going to look at here, uh, the f one of four is the uh, vastus lateralis. That's the red one. The green one is the rectus femoris. The blue one is the vastus intermedius. And lastly, this white one right here is the vastus medialis. Uh, now, the action for all these is to extend the stifle and flex the hip or the rectus. Uh, the origin for the rectus femoris is the ilium. But for all the vasti muscles, so the vastus lateralis, vastus intermedius, and vastus medialis, the origin is the proximal femur. The insertion for all of them is the tibial tuberosity. It is innervated by the femoral nerve. Now, going up here, we also have the patella which is a sesamoid bone. And we also have the patellar ligament, which extends from the patella to the tibial tuberosity. Okay, we are looking at the iliopsoas here. There are two parts to it. This is the psoas major, and it's longer and it starts from the lumbar vertebrae, while here in green we have pointed out the iliacus which starts, which is shorter and it starts from the craniovertebral ilium. However, they will both eventually enter into the lesser trochanter. They work together to flex the hip and they are innervated by the ventral branches of lumbar, lumbar spinal vertebrae nerves and the femoral nerve. Now we've moved down to the crux, or the lower leg. At the top part, there, all of this lower leg is covered with superficial uh, fascia, but when you're looking at the lower leg itself, that would be superficial crural, tarsal, metatarsal, and digital fasciae. They are similar to the superficial fasciae of the corresponding regions of the forelimb. Now, uh, the deep crural fasciae, which would be actually right here, this is a deep cruel fascia. It's a bit thicker. And just after that, we, over here you would have, sorry, here, you would have the cruel extensor retinaculum, which stretches obliquely from the distal third of the fibula to the medial malleolus of the tibia. It binds down the tendons of the long digital extensor and the cranial tibial muscles. So that would be around here. And down here, you would have the tarsal extensor retinaculum. All right, so now we are looking at the cranial tibial, which is the most cranial muscle of the cranial lateral muscles of the crux. It originates up here in the extensor groove and the adjacent articular margin of the tibia and the lateral edge of the cranial tibial border. It, now it inserts down here into the plantar surface of the base of the metatarsals, one and two, so it goes all the way down. Its action is to flex the tarsal curl joint and to rotate the paw laterally so that the plantar surface faces medially and is innervated by the fibular nerve. This is a long digital extensor shown by the white pin. In the distal crux, it runs under the curl extensor retinaculum. As a, ten as a tendons pass over the tarsus, they are surrounded by a synovial sheath and are held in place by the tarsal extensor retinaculum. So it orate, however, the muscle itself originates all the way up here in the extensor fossa of the femur, and then it inserts all the way down into the extensor processes of the distal phalanges of digits 2, 4, 3, 4, and 5. 
Well, however, what it does is to extend the digits and flex the tarsus, and it innervates the fibula, and it is innervated by the fibular nerve. This is the fibularis longus in green. It originates from the lateral condyle of the tibia, the proximal end of the fibula, and the lateral epicondyle of the femur by means of the lateral collateral ligament of the stifle. And it inserts down to the fourth tarsal bone, the plantar aspect of the base of the metatarsal. It works to flex the tarsus and rotate the paw medially so that the plantar surface faces laterally, and it is innervated by the fibular nerve. All right, we are looking at the gastrocnemius right here. It has two heads, and it forms the caudal bulge of the leg, also known as the calf, and contributes a major component of the common calcinian tendon, seen right here. It originates from the medial and lateral supracondylar tuberosities of the femur, so up here, and then it goes down to the proximal dorsal surface of the tuber calcinate. It works to extend the tarsus and flex the stifle, and it is innervated by the tibial nerve. So right there. Okay, now we are looking at the superficial digital flexor right here, which is a spindle-shaped muscle that originates from the lateral supracondylar tuberosity of the femur and inserts all the way down to the tuber calcinate and the basis of the middle phalanges of the digits 2, 3, 4, and 5. Its action is to flex the first two digital joints of the four principal digits, flex the stifle, and extend the tarsus. It is innervated by the tibial nerve, and as just to show a little bit, although it's not at this point so visible, but if when we made a sagittal incision through the superficial digital flexor tendon, we would have been able to see the large calcineal bursa, but it's not really possible since a lot of the fluid has been lost. All right, here we are looking at the digi deep digital flexor and the popliteus. In the blue, which is larger, we've got the lateral digital flexor. And here in the green, which is smaller, we've got the medial digital flexor. They originate from the caudal aspect of the proximal two-thirds of the tibia, the proximal half of the fibula, and the adjacent interosseous membrane. Then they insert um, into the flexor tubercle on the plantar surface of the base of each of the distal phalanges. Their action is to flex the digits and extend the tarsus. They are innervated by the tibial nerve. Then we mo move over to the yellow, which is the popliteus. They, or, or it originates from the lateral epicondyle of the femur and inserts into the proximal third of the caudal surface of the tibia. Its action is to rotate the leg medially, and it is innervated by the tibial nerve. Here's the sesamoid. It's kind of difficult to see, but it's at the junction of the tendon with the muscle, and it articulates with the caudal aspect of the lateral condyle of the tibia.